Good morning, everyone. I invite you to take your Bible, take your pen, take your notes, and uh, let's go to work. As we think about what it means to love one another. And our jumping off point today will be where we have jumped off uh, the last several weeks. We're going to turn to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And we're asking a question about our fellowship together. And the question we've been asking the last month is, uh, does Calvary Bible Church have a one another culture? And we have been looking for that answer. And, we, and, and by taking a look at the 60 or so one another passages in the New Testament. The commands from God's Word about the relationship you are to enjoy with other believers. What is that relationship to look like? What is its substance to be? What are its actions to be? What is its attitude to be? What is it to produce? And after we spend most of the summer and maybe even a little bit of September looking at the one another passages, we're then going to shift gears and study 1 Corinthians, a church that struggled mightily, struggled mightily to love one another. It did not come easy to them. In fact, Paul had to write them not one, not two, but four letters. We only have two of them. In fact, what you and I call 1 Corinthians is actually Paul's second letter to them. And what we call 2 Corinthians is actually his fourth letter to them. And in so doing, we're going to be looking in the mirror at ourselves. Do we have a one another culture? Are we loving one another the way Christ has asked us to? And so because these 60 passages are literally all over the place, they're in about 15 different uh, books in the New Testament. Multiple writers use them. Christ uses them in the, even in the Gospels. So I've been organizing them this way. We started, of course, with the general commands to love one another. And then we looked at the commands to be humble towards one another. And today, we're going to just spend one day looking at the calls to be unified with one another. To be in unity towards one another. To be like-minded towards one another. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at the commands related to service. So as you see in your notes today, what is our outline? The overarching umbrella is love one another. With humility, we've already talked about, in unity, we talk about today, for service, we'll spend the rest of the summer there. Why is this question so important? Is it worthy of this much time? Well, I think John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 answer that question. This is at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He is only a day or so away from his crucifixion. And this is what he says to his disciples. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. So he tells us how we are to do this. It's not just any way. It's not left up to our imaginations. It's not left up to our whim. It's not left up to our feelings. He's going to tell us how to do this. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then he says this remarkable statement. Verse 35. By this. Well, what's the this? Us loving one another. By us loving one, one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. This is our face to the world. This is our presentation to the world. Our love for one another. He says, this is how they're going to know that you are my disciples. If you love, if you have love for one another. The second century AD historian Tertullian was writing to 
folks in Rome about this, this, this interesting sort of peculiar group of people who called themselves Christians. I mean, by 197 AD, Christians are still kind of a peculiarity in the Roman Empire. People are still trying to kind of wrap their minds around what do these people actually do? And so he's writing about the fact that these Christians would take up offerings, they would, they would have a common collection, and then he talks about what they do with it. He says, these gifts, this is what he wrote, this is what Tertullian wrote, he said, these gifts are not spent on feast and drinking bouts and eating houses, but to support and bury poor people, to supply the wants of boys and girls destitute of means and parents. Of old persons confined now to the house, such too as have suffered shipwreck. And if there happen to be any in the mines or banished to the islands or shut up in the prisons for nothing but their fidelity to the cause of God's church, they become the nurslings of their confession. And then he writes this, but it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon them. See, they say, how they love one another. For those who are not Christians are so animated by mutual hatred. See, they say about Christians, how they are ready even to die for one another even though unbelievers would sooner kill. What an amazing thing to write about Christians. What's his observation of Christians? See how they love one another. Well, I believe that is what Jesus Christ wants for his church. That is the ambassadors he has asked us to be. And that is why we take time to look at these. And we're going to do it all summer. We're going to do it all through the fall in 1 Corinthians and may continue it even into 2024 as we think about and wonder do we have that, would that is that what they would write about Calvary Bible Church see how they love one another well today we have to turn our attention to unity and I want to say just a couple of things about unity before we jump straight into Ephesians chapter 2 in fact you can work your way there if you want to Ephesians chapter 2 um, unity is a thing that the church obviously desires, but you know, the world kind of desires it too. The world kind of desires unity as well. Tyrants certainly desire unity. Uh, if you just, just watch how Vladimir Putin's been dealing with the members of the high uh, command in the Wagner group that marched to within 100 miles of Moscow a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, they, they desire unity so badly that they will kill those who are disunified. So would a communist dictator like Xi Jinping in China or Kim Jong-un in North Korea. They, they desire unity so much so that they will kill those who disagree with them. What kind of unity does Jesus Christ call you and me to? We're about to see for the next few minutes that it's a unity uh, around righteousness. It's a unity that is like-minded in its purposes. It is like-minded in its goals and objectives. Our judgments are similar. Our focus is the same. This is not unity for the sake of unity. And that's really important. And that's why we have to start with a definition. When, we at, when we're talking about the unity of the New Testament, the unity we are all called to, to have towards one another, what kind of unity is that to be? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, the definition of unity is that we are to be unified around the person of Jesus Christ. We are not unified because we all enjoy hunting. We are not unified because we all enjoy fishing or gardening. We're not unified because we all enjoy certain hobbies or do the same jobs or are the same gender or the same age. That is not what unifies us. We are unified around the person of Jesus Christ. 
Listen in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. And I'll probably read a good portion of this. But what I want you to listen to is how the unity we are called to is flows from and is in our, our, our allegiance, our, our united allegiance to Jesus Christ. Paul writes to Ephesians verse 11, chapter 2, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, in other words, the Jews and the Gentiles weren't getting along, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, there's no unity. Zero unity at this point. Then watch as the unity come flowing in. Verse 13, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into what? One. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh. So he's the one that did it. He abolished in his flesh the enmity. You know, that's disunity. Enmity is disunity. I don't know what your translation may have, but he's saying it's, it, it's in the death of Christ that this lack of unity has been abolished, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance that he in himself, he might make the two into one new man. Listen to the unity. Thus establishing peace and, may, and, might, right, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. What is, it's not, this isn't just unity for the sake of unity. This is a call to be unified around the person of Jesus Christ. Are there any limits to this unity? Uh, well, there are. There are some units, limits to this unity. We are not seeking unity just for the sake of unity. Go to James chapter 4, verse 4. <clears throat> Hebrews and the book of James. If you can find Hebrews, uh, you're almost there. It's right after Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 4. There are limits to this unity. We are not simply seeking unity as a virtue in itself. We are seeking unity around first principles. We are seeking unity around the person of Jesus Christ. And there is no unity to be had. There's no unity to be had outside of that relationship. So look at James 4.4. He starts out pretty strongly. He says, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So don't you know that? You can't have unity with the world and unity with God. You can't do it. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world must make himself an enemy of God. In fact, Paul put it even more strongly in 1 Corinthians when he said, do you not realize you can't eat at the dinner of the demons and then come to the dinner of God. You can't have unity for the sake of unity. Now listen, there are plenty of churches who are seeking unity for unity's sake. In fact, there are some churches that are completely organized around the principle of just being unified with everyone. And that is their highest virtue. I would suggest to you we aren't, search, we aren't seeking for unity as its highest virtue. We are searching for unity as a vehicle towards righteousness, a vehicle towards the power of God, the vehicle towards being better witnesses of God, using it as a vehicle towards discipleship of one another. It's a medium. It's the thing that we use as a vehicle to reach that which is good and noble and virtuous. It is not in of itself a good thing if you are unified with evil. You can't have peace with God and peace with the world. You must choose. 
And quite frankly, I would strongly recommend that you not look to the world to find out how to do unity. They're just really bad at it. How bad are they? I um, let me see if I still have it here. This, this is six pages. I, I can't read them. I can't read all this to you. This is six pages of the wars going on in the world at this very moment. This is six pages of places where people are regularly shooting at each other. Of course, the most obvious one would be the U Ukraine-Russian war, where in 2022 there were estimated about 240,000 deaths, depending on who you're, who you're talking to. Right now, in the last year, the Ethiopian civil war has claimed 105,000 lives. And, of course, the long-standing, seemingly never-ending civil war in Myanmar last year claimed another 25,000 deaths. The world talks a lot about unity. It talks a lot about peace. It is clueless in how to get it. Absolutely clueless. The deaths from the wars in the 20th century, now that would have been 35 pages long. I didn't even print it. Actually, it was 35 pages of the wars from 1900 to 1944. It was another 30 pages or so to go from that to the year 1999. Total deaths, about 160 million. And the list just goes on and on. Yes, World War I is on the list. World War II are on the list. About 75 million deaths together in those. Uh, it starts in 1900 with the Boxer Rebellion. Then you've got the Ottoman War. You've got the Ottomans warring with everybody. The Mexican Revolution in 1910, Greece and Turkey, their long-time standing war, French and Vietnam War, which later became the U.S. and Vietnam War, Italy and Ethiopia, Bolivia and Paraguay, civil wars in the Balkans, Russia, China, Congo, Rwanda, Algiers, Tajikistan, Sierra Leone, you get the idea. How bad is the world at unity? Listen, it's so bad. I'll just use one battle. That Every time I think about this battle, it's just mind-numbing. It's the Battle of the Somme. During World War I. This was a four and a half month long battle. A million casualties. That was a tie. And did not move the front more than a mile at any given time. The British lost 19,240 soldiers dead on the very first day. The worst day in British history. And somebody thought it would be a good idea to keep fighting it for four more months. We are divided everywhere. There is no unity. You, the world will never show us the pathway to unity. It only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It only comes around the person of Jesus Christ. It only comes seeking the aims of Jesus Christ. We are divided politically. Our political parties are divided. Religion is divided. Social class, economic class, race, age, gender. Listen, it was bad enough when there were just two genders. <laughs> Philosophies, capitalism, socialism, ethnicity, language. And you know what the world's answer to this? I think in the riots in L.A. in the 1990s, I think Rodney King summed up the world's answer to how we're all going to fix this disunity. He said, quote, can't we all just get along? The answer, apparently not. And it's really, really exciting when you get almost run off the road by a guy who's got a bumper sticker that says, coexist. <laughs> as, jo as Joel Curry told me on Friday, he said, we can't even coexist in this lane. <laughs> You know what the world's strategy for unity is? If you Christians would just be quiet and stop making everything a big deal, we could all just get along. No, you can't. <laughs> it's funny. Listen, we're not the murderer. We're the coroner. <laughs> we're the ones who've shown up and said, you seem to have a lot of disunity here, and there's a lack of peace in every families that war together, parents with children, children with siblings, families. It's just, it's so elusive, isn't it? You might as well be asking, it's like asking an ant to push a bowling ball up Mount Everest. Actually, I think an ant would have more chance of pushing a bowling ball up Mount Everest than the world will ever have to find peace outside the person of Jesus Christ. This is why a group of born-again believers 
unified around the person of Jesus Christ for the purposes of Jesus Christ stands out like a sore thumb. It just does. The world looks at that and it is just an absolutely, it's a beacon of light in a very dark world. Now listen, you can be civil towards the world. You can be polite. Paul told the Romans, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. This is not a call to not be civil or polite. It is a call to recognize that you must be willing and able to recognize that they have a different worldview. They see righteousness differently. And we cannot make peace with them on those issues. We have to be unified amongst ourselves around Christ and his righteousness. So there are limits to this unity. It's not unity just for the sake of unity. It is unity, as we're going to see, around righteousness and the person of Jesus Christ. What is God's contribution to this unity? Well, of course, uh, he's the one that makes it possible. Go with me to John chapter 17. I'd like you to see the Lord's Prayer. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, this isn't the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it really is. This is Jesus' prayer for you and me. This is the Lord praying. What we often call the Lord's Prayer, which begins, you know, our Father who art in heaven, that's really the disciples' prayer. He's teaching us as his disciples how to pray. That's really the disciples' prayer. You want the Lord's Prayer? Go to John 17. It's quite beautiful, by the way. This is just beautiful. I want you to see how beginning in verse 20, on the night of his death, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is less than 24 hours from an awful death, is praying for our unity. It's, it's just beautiful. Listen to this. He says, I do not ask, so he's praying, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, talking about his current disciples. He's not just asking this for Peter and James and John and Andrew. He's asking it for you and me. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that would be you and me, that they may all be one. Isn't that glorious? Even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That is just mind-numbing, isn't it? He wants you and me to be one the way he God the Son is one with God the Father. That is a singleness of purpose. That is a singleness of focus. And that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. See, once again, you see what's at stake here? Our representation of the King. This unity is making us a better voice for him. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know, and there's the kicker, isn't it? That the world may know, that thou didst send me and didst love them, even as thou didst love I mean, this is absolutely beautiful. It's a prayer for unity. It's a prayer for unity like the unity enjoyed by God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ. Christ is in God and we enjoy reconciliation with God, that unity. And it brings a unity in righteousness and in like-mindedness and in spirit that the world cannot ignore. What is our contribution to this unity? Hmm. Listen, our contribution to this unity that Jesus is, is, is going to be great personal sacrifice. Let me repeat that. Our contribution to this unity, this unity around the person of Jesus Christ, this unity around righteousness and a like mindedness is going to come at great personal sacrifice. Go to Matthew chapter 5. If we're going to have unity, folks, you got to be ready to sacrifice to get it. 
You're going to have to be ready to give up things to get it. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, beginning at verse 38. Jesus has a lot to say about a thing that has a lot to do about our unity together. He first opens up by talking about disunity or potential strife. Verse 38, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. By the way, that's a pretty just standard. At the time that Moses wrote an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, I would say and suggest to you that is the most just system ever proposed in the history of man. Because before that, you know what it was? Somebody put out your eye, you just chopped off their head. Somebody burned one hut in your village, you went back to their village and burned all their huts. There wasn't an eye for an eye. That was a very, this was a very just but he's going to suggest something else that's going to require personal sacrifice that's going to preserve the unity of the brothers. But I say to you, Christ says, but I say to you in verse 39, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, to turn to him the other also. In other words, when you have a personal insult, a personal slight, just offer the other cheek up. And if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Notice how this is a great preserver of unity. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, uh, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. In other words, be generous. This is, per this is a personal sacrifice for the sake of unity. The poor Corinthian church was so struggling with this that apparently they were dragging one another into court. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. They apparently were suing one another. And Paul wrote them and said, you know, this is not a great look for our unity. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Listen, if we're going to preserve unity, you're going to have to be willing to do it at great personal sacrifice, which means on more trivial matters, you're going to have to be willing to be defrauded. Does any one of you, he says in verse 1, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? He said, listen, this is really embarrassing to the church of Christ that you are suing one another in court. Verse 2, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? He said, you need to settle this amongst yourselves in a way that preserves the unity. He goes on in verse 3, do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? If then you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who have no account to the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren. But brothers go to law with brother and that before unbelievers. He said, this is really destructive of the unity that you are literally suing one another in human, secular, decadent pagan courts. Verse 7, actually then it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? You and your Christian brother live side by side and you're in an argument about whether a tree is on your side of the property line or on his side of the property line. He wants to cut it down. You don't want to cut it down. You know what he's saying? You know, rather than go to court, just let him cut it down. Why would you not? He's like, why would you not just rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud and yet in that your brethren he said, yes, listen, you're going to preserve unity. You're going to have to be willing to do it at great personal sacrifice. Sometimes you just have to say, you want to sue me for my coat? Take my shirt too. You know why? Because there's more at stake than you, whether you are getting defrauded or not. There's more at stake. There's a bigger game going on than whether you are upset with your neighbor or your brother. 
And we have to preserve the unity so that we do not destroy our testimony to the world. Great personal sacrifice. So let's look at the actual commands to uh, be unified together. And uh, we're going to start in some strange places. At first, when I start reading this, you're going to say, what in the world does this have to do with unity? And you know what the answer is? Everything. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50. Unity produces righteousness. We are to be unified in the pursuit of righteousness. This is not unity for unity's sake. It is unity for the sake of pursuing righteousness together. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Wow, this is really interesting. And you think, uh, this may have nothing to do with being unified in that peace. And it turns out it has everything. Verse 42, it says, And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. Yeah, we're all in the pursuit of righteousness. That's what we're doing. And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Verse 47, and if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, and with, and with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Listen, guys, there's no peace to be had amongst one another if we're not pursuing righteousness. We are to be unified in our pursuit of righteousness. That's what it's about. He's saying, and how, and how much are you to, how eager are you to be in the pursuit of righteousness? How Fervent are you to be in your pursuit of righteousness together with one another? You are to be so fervent in it that you'd be willing to give up your hand to get it. You'd be willing to give up your foot to get it. Now, obviously, Jesus is not encouraging us to do self-mutilation. What Jesus is encouraging us to do is to pursue righteousness together with all of our might, in all of our strength, in all of our being. That's what brings peace. Boy, nothing unites a people like chasing after righteousness. That unites us. It gives us common, it gives us common cause, doesn't it? It gives us common purpose and common, common objectives. Listen, this pursuit is so important. Do you know that Jesus' very first instruction to the church was all about the pursuit of righteousness? Go to Matthew 18. This is Jesus' first instructions ever to the church. And you know what it's about? It's about pursuing righteousness. Some of you will recognize it. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. Before I read this, just spoiler alert. It contains three efforts to preserve unity, followed by then an exaltation of righteousness. So listen to this. This is how important this pursuit is. Jesus' first instructions were about how you and I are to come together and be unified and to pursue righteousness. And it says, and if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. That preserves the unity. If he goes, you're right, I shouldn't be doing this. I've sinned, I'm going to repent. The unity is preserved. Verse 16, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So that's a second attempt to preserve the unity. You go to him with more witnesses. They all say, listen, brother, you are sinning and violating the word of God. And he says, you're right. I have. I need to stop doing that. You've preserved the unity. Verse 17. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So now this is the third attempt to preserve the unity. The church probably through its leadership, comes to the person and says, yes, we are confirming through these witnesses that what you are doing is a violation of God's word. We are calling to you repent. He says, okay, I get it. 
you're right. This is not wise. I'm, and this is not good. We are not pursuing righteousness together. I'm going to repent. Well, then you've preserved the unity. But then, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him go. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. That's when you have to remove that person from the fellowship because they are now destroying the unity around the pursuit of righteousness. They're destroying the unity and you have to remove them. And then he goes on and says, uh, again, I, in verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Notice this is not about you just asking for anything you want. This is about asking for unity around the pursuit of righteousness. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Well, listen, Jesus is with you all the time. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Christ is in all places at all times. He's always with you. What's he talking about here? He's saying, listen, when you're acting in unity to preserve the pursuit of righteousness, you are doing it as if I'm right there doing it with you. That's, that is your purpose. Pursue righteousness. Likewise, you need to be single-minded. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Another one of the commands, the one another commands related to unity. Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Hear the unity. It's a unity of single-mindedness. It's a unity of mind and thought and judgment. It's a unity of discernment using the same eye, namely the eye of Scripture, to have the same worldview, to study Scripture together as a group, to look through in, through the same lens. When my kids were still at home, and, and we homeschooled all three of our children, and uh, I remember one of the one of the dads who was really into astronomy had an astronomy night where we all came to his house in October. It was late at it was at dusk, and and Saturn was apparently in a really good position to be viewed through a telescope. And so in their backyard, everybody who owned a telescope had brought it. And so telescopes were set up all over the backyard. And he said, even if you don't have a telescope, come. You'll be able to see Saturn. You'll be able to see its rings. And so we were all invited to come and take a look. And it was interesting with all those, those different telescopes all over the backyard, many of them had a different strength on their lens. And if you look through some, and he worked with all of them to get them set up just so they were on Saturn. Some of them, their lens was so weak, they could not even see it. You just couldn't see Saturn. Others, you'd look through it, and Saturn was just a smudge. It looked like somebody smudged the lens with a little bit of light. And then there were lenses where it was really quite spectacular. You could look through that lens and you could actually see the outline of the rings around Saturn, which was just really super cool. And we can't be like that as a church. We can't all be looking through different lenses. We have to be looking through the same lens, seeing and understanding the same truths and acting upon those truths in the same way. This is a call to be of like-mindedness. <coughs> Jesus wants us to be united in thought and in judgment and in discernment and to have a worldview that is biblically the same. Well, finally, one last command, and Peter kind of sums it up. 1 Peter 3.8 just kind of sums up the whole thing, doesn't it? <laughs> In fact, he says to sum up. I love this verse. <laughs> it's kind of nice when you're teaching the Bible and you come to a verse like this where Peter says, well, I just want to sum this up. 1 Peter 3.8, to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Yeah, let, let all of us be harmonious. He had just been talking about our relationship with the government. He had been talking about our relationship uh, with our masters. Some of these uh, individuals were still slaves, and they had masters, and then he was talking about our relationship within our marriages. He said, let me sum this all up. Let all be harmonious. Be united in purpose and effort. Lock arms in harmony around all things. So all of our purposes 
are to be united. Well, unity really advances Christian ministry. And to close, I just want to look at an instance in the book of Acts where things could have gone sideways really quick. Unity could have been blown apart really quick. Acts 15. This is a very tension-filled moment for the early church where things could have flown, thrown, flown apart and been quite hard to retrieve. Paul and Barnabas are going to have a little bit of a disagreement. And I think, you know, from 2,000 years later, we're kind of surprised by this because we have tremendous respect for Paul and we have tremendous respect for Barnabas. We know these are godly men who love Jesus Christ and who were certainly united in their desire to serve and advance the kingdom of Christ. So we're a little surprised that they can't get along on this issue. But I want to show you how they handled it. And then I want to talk about the long-term effects of it in, on the church because it has a really unifying effect. Verse 36, Acts 15. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Well, that's a great purpose. Let's go back and check on these churches we planted. Let's go back and see how they're doing. Verse 37, and Barnabas was desirous of taking John called Mark along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and, not, and had not gone with them to the work. So what's the dispute? Well, they think one of them, Barnabas, wants to take John Mark. Paul says, nope, he was with us in Pamphylia and he abandoned us. And because he didn't stick to it, I don't want him with us. Verse 39, and there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus where they had planted some churches. And Paul chose Silas and departed being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. In other words, he consulted with the church. They chose Silas. Silas went with Paul and they went to check on churches and Barnabas went with Mark. And this has always baffled Christians. We're just so baffled by this. How is it these two great believers could not see eye to eye on this? And listen, we don't know what Paul was really upset about. There's a lot of speculation. The speculation is, is that John Mark was so upset that Paul was teaching the Gentiles that he snuck back to Jerusalem and tattletailed on Paul. There's some speculation that may have happened. You can see where that might rub Paul the wrong way. In fact, that caused what happened earlier in Acts 15. Paul had to go back to Jerusalem and defend himself. And you know what the Jerusalem council decided? They decided, yeah, Paul's kind of right on this. Paul's going in the right direction. There's one gospel. It applies the same to Christians and Jews and Gentiles, rather. Gentiles don't have to become Jews first. Remember, we had that conversation in Galatians a few months, about a month and a half ago. They don't have to get circumcised first to become Christians. They don't have to become Jews first and then Christians. So Paul kind of won the debate, but there's some speculation that John Mark is the one who stirred all that up. Well, Barnabas is going, look, he's still useful. He, he gets it. He now understands that you were right. Let's take him with us. He'll be a big help to us. Paul said, nope, not going to do it. And so they split into two groups and the work carried on. The work carried on. They went and checked on these churches. But you know what the beautiful part of this is? The beautiful part of this is, is that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark continued later on to work together. It's really quite wonderful. In writing to Timothy, you know what Paul wrote to Timothy? He said, listen, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. So later on, Paul returned to service with John Mark. In fact, in, to the Colossians, Paul wrote this. He said, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. You know what Paul and Barnabas ended up doing? Put their disagreement aside for the sake of the unity of the mission. 
They said there's something bigger going on here than whether you and I both happen to respect John Mark. There's a bigger aim here. And glory be to God that all of these men worked out that we have a divinely assigned mission which is much more important and much more critical and much more significant than our petty disagreements. The mission is bigger than any one of us and we have to be unified around it. You know, when I was, when I was in middle school age and really even late elementary middle school, in high school, the sport I played was soccer. That's what I played growing up. And so you take a bunch of teenage boys on a team and they're practicing every single day and then they're having games. You know, when you take a bunch of teenage boys and put them together that much, fights break out. Disagreements break out. And often teammates would beat each other's throats. But I always thought it was really funny that when we got to the game, and they now had a self-serving unity around trying to win the game, they could always put those disagreements aside for 90 minutes while we played the game. They knew how to put the mission first. How sad is it that around something as petty as a athletic contest, people know how to call timeout on their anger long enough to, to play together and win the game. But oftentimes in the church of Jesus Christ, where there's so much more at stake, we struggle to be unified around the mission and to preserve the unity for the sake of the mission. Listen, we all, it's almost a cliche, isn't it, that church is split over the color of the carpet? Listen, there's never been a church in the history of mankind that split over the color of the carpet. You know what they split over? They split over who was going to decide the color of the carpet. <laughs> There's never been a church in the history of mankind that split over whether the church was going to start at 9.30 or 10.30. They split over who was going to decide who, what time we were going to start. You know what the first casualty of the lack of unity is? The mission. The person of Jesus Christ is just brought into shame. We need to be unified. We, it's desperate for us to be unified around what matters and be gracious towards one another about what doesn't matter. And that takes a lot of discernment and a lot of study to figure out what is on each list. It's going to be very difficult for any group of believers to build a one another culture when they do not have humility towards one another and they do not have unity around the person of Jesus Christ and the mission that he has given us. A mission to make disciples, a mission to be good witnesses, a mission to love one another, and then doing all three of those things, we exalt him. And quite frankly, I, I see my job as the elder is to make sure we never take our eye off those three balls. We're juggling three balls here, and I never want to take my eye off them. Making disciples, being witnesses, loving one another. Otherwise, we're just a loose affiliation of some authentic believers who corporately have become dead. Otherwise, we're just, I mean, we don't want to be Isaiah's shack in a turnip field, do we? We don't want to become useless to God. We don't want to become a place where people come to a hymn sing on Sunday morning and they hear an informational talk and then they go home and there's no unity around mission. <clears throat> Are we just solo contractors, each one doing his own thing? Are we a unified body acting corporately for the glory of Jesus Christ? These are important questions. And I think that as we, I really am looking forward to next week. Because now we get to sink our teeth into the one another passages related to actual acts of service towards one another. And that's the meat. I can't wait to get to it. So to that end, let's pray about the importance of unity. And then next week, let's get excited about thinking about how we are to serve one another and what kind of acts are we to do this. So let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for making unity possible. We recognize that uh, we were born in a natural state of being selfish and self-serving and self-seeking. And praise God that you have saved us and given us a new nature a new nature where we no longer live, but it is Christ that lives in us. 
And we are one with him, and he is one with you, and therefore we are one with you. Oh, Lord, give us a clarity of purpose. Give us a like-mindedness that allows us to act in a unified way in the pursuit of your commands to your glory. We want to be the people you want us to be. We want to represent you the way you have asked us to represent you. How glorious it is to read the words of Tertullian who says, Oh, how they loved one another. Oh, that the people of Norton Shores might say that about us. Oh, how they love one another. Oh, how they have unity. Oh, how they are all on the same page as they move forward. And not in just little pockets of solo contractors. We... We want unity, and we know it's we know it's elusive. We know it's going to fight hard. We know that it's easy to be disunified. It's easy to be at each other's throats. It's easy to be angry. Grant to us peace, the peace that comes from a unity around you and around your goals and your purposes. And we ask this very humbly as we head into this new week. Help us to redeem the time for good. Help us to be to not be tricked by the schemes of the evil one. Keep us from sin and keep us in your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.